All right, as of this week, the pandemic is worse than ever with over 100 million new recorded cases worldwide and in total 2.2 million deaths. That's extraordinary. All of this during social distancing, mask wearing, lockdowns, and all kinds of precautionary measures taken depending on which country you live in. With vaccines starting to be distributed, there's at least a little bit of hope on the horizon. And with that hope comes the desire to travel, at least for me, I have a severe severe wanderlust actually it's it's kind of a problem with that traveling comes customs baggage airplanes and passports and maybe even soon vaccine passports but we didn't always need passports so how did that come about when did we start needing to use our passports just to board a flight or go to the next country and why are they so important anyway let's go for a trip on this episode of scientific drinking cheers So tonight I'm drinking Infinite Ale Works West Floridian Christmas. It's a Belgian Abbey quad. It's it's good, but it's uh, yeah, it packs a little bit of a punch. So if you're like me and 42% of my fellow Americans, which is a record number by the way, or 75% of people in the UK, or pretty much everyone in Finland, which has the highest number of passport holders per capita in the world, then you have one of these. Passport. Between 1882 and 1954, 12 million immigrants came through the famed Ellis Island, an immigration port in New York. And of those, upwards of 80% of them didn't really have any significant official form of identification. They didn't have passports, they didn't have papers. They just kind of gave their name. In fact, the immigration process at the time only took a few hours. The passport itself wasn't even standardized, agreed upon until the 1980s. And that, by the International Civil Aviation Authority, 1980, that's, that's just before I was born. I mean, many of us still have memories of 1980. Why and how did the passport become so important? And why is it that we can't even dream of international travel without carrying one with us today? That being said, it's not as though passports didn't exist before 1980. They did. I mean, many people had passports. And passports date back all the way to around 500 BC. The earliest evidence of a passport may in fact have come from the Tanakh, or the Jewish Bible, which states, If it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of Trans-Euphrates, so that they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah. Although this letter of safe passage to the king may have at first seemed like a far cry from the passport that we use today, it wasn't really all that different. A passport is, as a matter of fact, and I quote, a document that certifies the identity and nationality of its holder primarily for the purpose of international travel. Its name comes from French, the word pass, which means to go through, and the word for gate, port. Put them together and you're passing through a gate, or passport. Initially, the requirement of people to have a passport in and around the time of World War I, especially immediately after World War I, this was kind of an astonishing idea at the time. I mean, you had to attach your photograph to a document with your name on it to prove that you were who you said you were. This to people that had moved freely as long as they can remember. It was kind of a strange idea. In fact, it was described in British press as a nasty dehumanization. However, let's think of how people used to move around before the 20th century, before the passport was a mandatory thing. Travel was limited to ships, each of which had a manifest and crew. Travel from one country to another was far less frequent, and journeys often taking anywhere from a few days to a few months, depending on the mode of travel and the distance. Remember, this was before airlines, before most international railways, before any real robust infrastructure connecting countries. So travel was a lot more arduous than it is for us today. Many of us privileged enough to live in a wealthy nation take travel, or at least the ability to travel for granted. We can hop on a plane, a train, or a bus, and just go to the next country. All we need is our passport and a bag. But before 1900, and especially before 1850, this was unheard of for anyone but the most wealthy. Trips across the ocean were long and dangerous, and only undertaken at great cost and for a great need. Thus, there was little need for governments to keep track of the movement of people across their borders. Unless it was an army, then it really didn't matter. Especially since relatively few people 
were traveling, especially great distances at the time. It's, it's tempting to view the advent of passports as a violation of freedom rather than a product of necessity. But as we will soon see, keeping track of so many people is a gargantuan task, undertaken only as a matter of need, rather than some misguided desire to control. Remember, it was the International Civil Aviation Organization that took it upon themselves to regulate and standardize passports so that all countries could use them and communicate effectively with one another and make air travel easier. It certainly wasn't an effort by them to take over the world. That being said, the governments of the world certainly played a significant role in the development and issuance of passports. The League of Nations, the ill-fated precursor to the UN, established standards for passports for the first time in 1920, and clarified efforts in several successive meetings. Following the Second World War, the UN convened a conference to enforce those standards, but no action was really taken as a result. In fact, the use of passports is still, to this day, not a globally accepted practice. There's still one country which refuses to acknowledge the validity of passports. Yeah, you guessed it. North Korea. Nonetheless, here we are with a document that we are so familiar with today. The standard biometric RFID passport. Now with the rise of COVID-19, the passport is getting a new significance and potentially a new role, or perhaps a supplementary one. Now we're getting into the meat and potatoes of the matter. Immunity passports. This is not quite the same as a vaccine passport, which we'll talk about more in a minute. An immunity passport would show that the bearer would have an immunity against COVID-19. That sounds good, right? If they're immune to COVID-19, that means that they can't get the virus and they can't spread it, right? Well, not so fast. Evidence taken from both humans and macaques has shown that although an individual may be protected from the effects of the coronavirus after immunization, they may still have the potential to spread it just as much as they would if they were not immunized. This is why it's so important to practice social distancing and mask wearing even after you've gotten the vaccine, because you don't know that you can't spread it yourself even if you're not showing any symptoms or can't really get sick yourself. There are also many ethical issues that arise when discussing immunity passports, and there are lessons to be learned from other situations where such things were put into practice. Take, for example, the spread of yellow fever, antebellum, or before the Civil War, in New Orleans. With little understanding of mosquito-borne illnesses, the only way to appropriately get used to living in New Orleans was to become, as they put it, acclimated. This simply involved getting the disease and surviving. That sounds good until I say that the survival rate of yellow fever at the time was around 50%, and yellow fever by itself killed about 8% of New Orleans populations annually. This led to a disparity between those who had survived and those that didn't, with the, quote, acclimated population leveraging their immunity to exercise greater power over those who didn't, socially, economically, and politically. Now, COVID-19 isn't as bad as yellow fever when it comes to mortality rate, that's obvious, but it does spread a lot faster, and that is an important factor. Yellow fever killed around 150,000 people in the 1970s and 1980s, from New Orleans to Boston. By comparison, COVID-19 has killed almost 500,000 Americans in a single year. The purpose of this comparison isn't to fear monger, but to illustrate that the yellow fever could create such a society on a small scale then one might be able to imagine the worst case scenario for something like an immunity passport. There's also the possibility that this would incentivize people to go out, get sick, so that they naturally build up the immunity and therefore could be allowed to travel. I mean, that's mind-blowingly selfish, especially considering you do that. Hard to, hard to think like that. And then there's issues about equal access, about the reliability and implementation of the vaccine, about discrimination, about <laughs> you get the point. It's pretty much a big can of worms. But remember how I said that an immunity passport isn't the same as a vaccine passport? Well, it's not. And here's why. As an aside, this isn't an episode about vaccines, and I'm not going to cater to conspiracy theorists any more than I unfortunately already have. So join me in the assumption that vaccines are safe. The idea behind a vaccine passport is that it's a digital companion to your physical passport. And it's an idea being hurriedly pushed through all the paperwork and standardization by the International Air Transport Association, or AITI. 
It's no surprise that this is being pushed by an organization that oversees international air travel. I mean, 10% of the world's population traveled at least once per year on an airline prior to the pandemic. And we're likely to see those kind of numbers again. Like the regular biometric passport before it, the challenge is to have a standardized format that all nations would recognize, eliminating the need for a two-week period of isolation now imposed by many nations around the world. Now, notionally, this vaccine passport wouldn't just show records of vaccination. It would also show if you're naturally immune because you already got the virus and you've built up an immunity. It would show if you've been tested right before flight and are good to go. And it would show if, in fact, you've been vaccinated as well. So there's three different parts of this vaccination passport and it allows flexibility. Now, having these three different ways to qualify yourself for travel is very important for the democratization of international travel because it'll take time for the vaccine to get distributed and not everyone has access to vaccines. Different countries are receiving them at different times and it's just gonna take a while for everyone to get immune. On top of that, it lightens the load on national health infrastructure. I mean, if everyone had to get tested or everyone had to get immunized, then the national infrastructure is pushed to its breaking point as it pretty much already is. But by allowing different ways to do it, you can have some testing and some immunizing and maybe some people that are already naturally immune. You might say, okay, what about that thing you said earlier where you can even transmit even though you're immune? Well, yeah, that's, that's still a risk. Besides, there's always risk when you put a bunch of people in a pressurized metal tube sharing the same air. There's only really so much you can do to protect people, but everything you do helps, at least a little bit. All right, so why does this impact you and why should you care? Well, even if you're not planning on hopping on an airplane anytime soon, there are some incentives for you to seek out the vaccine passport already being pushed by many nations around the world. For example, at the recent annual sports ball event, the audience was composed largely of vaccinated healthcare workers. Likewise, it could be possible that in the near future, concerts, sporting events, and large gatherings of all kinds may require vaccine passports to attend for your safety and for the safety of others. But before you go spouting off about your rights, remember that these are privately organized events and people who organize events can make their own rules. One more thing to consider is that this really isn't a new concept at all. Things like the vaccine passport have already been put in place and are practiced even now and have been practiced for the past 50 years. And no, I'm not talking about New Orleans. <coughs> Already, children attending public schools must show that they have been vaccinated. For nearly half a century, people traveling to some countries are required to show that they have vaccinations in diseases such as yellow fever, rubella, and cholera, and are presented with what's called a yellow card to prove this. And anyone who joins the military must receive a lot, and I mean a lot, of vaccines, regardless of if you say that you have received them before or not. Getting vaccinated is an important part of interacting with a large group of people, something more and more of us do on a daily basis, especially as urbanization increases across the world. But there's still many challenges to overcome when implementing this vaccine passport. For one, this is the first of its kind to be purely digital, which might be a challenge to the 1.1 billion people who don't have access to a cell phone, or the estimated 1 billion people who don't have a birth certificate or proof of identity. In many cases, both apply, and granted, these are not usually the people who you'd find traveling in economy class from the US to Tokyo, but nevertheless, it could prove an obstacle for equal access in the future, and strictly speaking, these passports don't have to be digital. Basically, there's a right way and a wrong way of doing this, and it can be a little difficult to tell which is which a priori, especially with the economic and political pressure of moving into a post-pandemic world. But although this is a difficult situation, I have faith that as long as we keep in mind the challenges that we faced, we can move past this and execute this well. Well, thanks for watching and safe travels in the near future. Cheers.